Okay. Um, welcome to everybody. Um, I'm Nathan Danielson. I'm a conference co-chair. Um, and part of the goal of this conference is to showcase some of the great work happening in the Los Angeles data community. I'm really happy to introduce one of the last two keynotes who both of them are Los Angeles locals doing great, great things, yet in very different industries. Ben Welsh <laughs> is the editor of the Los Angeles Times Data Desk, a team of reporters and computer programmers in the newsroom who, who work to collect, organize, analyze, and present large am amounts of information. Ben is also co-founder of the California Civic Data Coalition, an open source network of developers working to open up public data. Ben is also creator of Past Pages, an archive, of, an archive dedicated to the preservation of online news. Ben has worked at the Los Angeles Times since, two, since 2007. Before working at the Times, Ben conducted data analysis for investigative projects at the Center, Center for Public Integrity in Washington, D.C. Projects he has contributed to have been awarded numerous pri prizes, including the Pulitzer. I met Ben through an education program he was leading through the Knight Foundation, Python for Data Journalists Analyzing Money in Politics. The educational program, um, this, this program taught journalists how to use Python, Pandas, Jupyter Notebooks, and related Python tools to help investigate money in politics. Another interesting fact, I was just browsing through GitHub, through Ben's GitHub, and I noticed that he has made it accepted contributions to Pandas, Jupyter Lab, Altair, probably several others. Um, as a conference chair, I'm excited to hear about some of the tools that, his, that this community supports and maintains are being utilized by the LA Times. Um, please, join, uh, please welcome me in joining Ben Welsh. Hello. How are you guys? Good, good. It took a minute to get set up because I tried to plug my Linux computer into this fancy system. You can guess how well that went. We're back on the Apple. Uh, so this is me, Ben Welsh, like you heard. This is what my wife calls my Bible salesman photo, <laughs> which is definitely not a compliment. Uh, I go by Pale Wire online. That's my handle on most things. That's a long story. Um, and all the slides that I'm going to walk through here today are available for you online at this URL. Uh, who is Datadesk? LAT.MS, who is Datadesk? If you go there, you can follow along, you can breeze ahead, you can um, share it with somebody else. And also, I'd, I'll point out in the lower corner here on the right will be little hyperlinks that will link off to every example I show. Because I'm going to go through a lot of stuff really fast and just to try to keep it interesting. And if there's anything you want to check out, just uh, go to this link and just look for the little blue link in the corner. Okay, you should be able to find it. So um, back at my first slide, I had the old LA Times headquarters downtown. That's actually not where we work anymore. The LA Times has recently moved to El Segundo, which I'm, I'm taken to calling Gundo. Uh, and so if you drive down, take the 105 to LAX, you'll see on your office, that's where the data desk sits every day on the sixth floor there doing our job. And what the heck do computer programmers do in a newsroom? Well, they do a couple things, and I'm going to walk you through them, all right, and give you examples of each. The first thing we do and we do a lot of this, is we take data, and for some reason this is like the emoji for data. No one's ever explained it to me. Uh, <laughs> if, you know, if you know what the heck that is, please let me know. I'm told it's a database, right? We take data, big chunks of information as our raw material. They're our input, right? And then we process those datas and th that data and we turn it into stories, right? And so that's what one big thing the data desk does is we turn databases into news. And that means we write code. So even though I went to journalism school and I got started in TV news and other people in our uh, uh, team went to journalism school for the most part or were librarians or were other things, we all write computer code. But, um, and that includes Python like this and a lot of other things. But we still also write in English. So even though we're computer programmers, that doesn't mean we're just like nerds in a cubicle in the corner and we don't participate in making and telling stories. We also still do that too. So let me tell you a story of how that went. But before we go, here's some late breaking news. Numbers in the news. There's a big number tonight in the news. Does anyone know what it is? 1.6 billion is the number in the news today, and that's because there will be a mega millions jackpot for that amount, all right? And through this speech, I'm going to be doing some quick trivia questions, some easy, some hard, and if you shout out the correct answer, you will win one ticket in tonight's mega millions lotto for 1.6 billion dollars. 
all right? And should you win, should you win, I, I don't expect anything, all right? But you should consider maybe writing a check to Num Focus. Uh, if you have 1.6 billion, you might need the tax shelter, okay? So let's start with an easy one. This will be the easiest one. What's on this map? California, who was it? One ticket, come collect. All right. There you are, sir. All right, so that's an easy one. The map's going to zoom in a little closer. It's now here. What's, the, what's on this map? No, no. What? Santa Barbara County. Who said it? Come get your ticket. Okay, so California has 58 counties. I know you guys are numbers people. So there's 58 counties, one of which is L.A. County, the best county. But maybe second best, if we're being generous, might be Santa Barbara County, which is just up the coast, a little north of where we are now. He says it's pretty cool. I can't disagree. And then if we zoom in a little closer, here's a tougher question. Within Santa Barbara County, if we zoom in on this area right here, we're going to see that. Does anybody know what that is? Hmm? No. 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 <laughs> no. No. So there's Gaviota. Here's your hint, right? Gaviota's over here. And you just keep going. What's that? It's something, Ranch. You can't win twice. All right, so we're moving on. It is actually Hollister Ranch. Does anyone know what Hollister Ranch is? This is a picture of it. It's a, it's a, a subdivision in the mountains just west of Santa Barbara City that is private. It has private roads and uh, about 130 houses, including mansions populated by people like James Cameron and the founder of Patagonia and Jackson Brown. And they have a beautiful subdivision with many, many rich mansions. And they have actually closed off the roads from the public, including access to the public beaches, like this beautiful one here. And um, if you read the LA Times, you can read stories by my colleague, Rosanna, who writes about environment and coastal access here in California, and you'd see stories like this, like she did recently. And if you were to read that, you would learn that, you know, in California, the public has a right to access the beach, right? It's, the beach is public property. But in this case, the road that goes to the beach is not, right? And the residents of Hollister Ranch have spent the last several decades trying to make sure that those roads don't get open to the public. And the only way you can really get to the beach is on horseback or by kayak, all right? And one of those people who's attempted to kayak to Hollister Ranch on a few occasions is our city columnist, Steve Lopez, who writes a lot about coastal access. And he's, he thinks that stuff like that should be opened up, and he's curious to learn more about elite places like Hollister Ranch and how they're run. So after Rosanna did this story recently, Steve got a tip. And then Steve called me on the phone. And he said, Ben, have you ever heard of something called the Williamson Act? I said, Steve, I have no goddamn clue what you're talking about. And like any good scientist, I went to Google and then to Wikipedia, right? And I looked it up and I read this, and it says the Williamson Act is a law in the state of California that says that certain agricultural lands that are certified by local county authorities, so there's 58 different ways of doing it, right, are able to be designated as agricultural something or other under state law and then given, guess what, a hefty property tax break, right? And Hollister Ranch, even though it's a subdivision, said his tip is still also classified as agricultural because there's a cattle operation uh, run by two or three residents that are allow their cows to wander around everyone else's property, whether they participate in it or not. Sounds like a pretty good tip, but how do you check that kind of thing out? Well, this is where data can help. So Steve and I went to the county assessor's website, and then we actually called up a guy who works in the appraisal division there. And we said, do you guys track any of this? You know, like, uh, we got this tip, we heard this thing, is it really true, what is it, what's it about? And the guy started walking us through the assessor's website. And on this website, there's a database. And if you're, like, in our business, on the outside of these big data systems, unlike, say, Hunter Owens earlier from L.A. City, who's on the inside, if you're on the outside like us, you're always kind of fumbling around. We don't know what data the government keeps and what it really is in there and who has it or da-da-da-da-da. But what we love are web forms, right? Because web forms signify there's a database. And we started interviewing this guy, and we are like, well, what about, like, James Cameron's house or whoever? Just, like, pick one. And the guy came up with a parcel number, which is the unique ID for a property. You punch it in there, and he pointed out this site to us, you know? 
And this is what's called the value notice, which is published online for every property in Santa Barbara County. And if you qualify for the Williamson Act, someone, someone perhaps anticipating what Steve Lopez would like to do, right, had created this table that exists on every parcels page, which says, hey, under normal property tax rules, and as the state of California, a property is assessed under what's called Prop 13, right? Under normal property tax rules, this property would be assessed at $750,000, and its property tax would be 1.1% of that approximately, right? But because it was called agricultural, and sorry, this is kind of grainy here, that number went down from 750000 to only 338000 Whoa! That cut this person's property tax in half, right? Gee, I wonder if everybody in Hollister Ranch whether they participate in ranching or not, get that kind of benefit, right? Well, how do we figure it out? So that, that's, there's Hollister Ranch. So we go back to this map. You may have noticed that this map didn't look as nice as the previous ones, because those other ones came from Google. This one came from MyQGIS. <laughs> as ugly as it is, it is a beautiful tool. It's open source software that allows you to take electronic map files called shape files. You guys know all this stuff. I normally talk to journalists. I'll just stop with that. QGIS, this is a file I got from, guess what, the county surveyor's website where I was nosing around and, hey, there's a shape file that has all the subdivisions. When I looked in the attributes, I saw, hey, they, these are marked as Hollister Ranch. Then I, I nosed around a little more and I found they have an FTP online. Oh my gosh, and the FTP has every parcel, right? Oh, okay. This, I get excited, guys. And then I put that in my QGIS. So now here's every parcel in Santa Barbara County, and there's Hollister Ranch. If now, if I'm going to do this analysis, I need to like cookie cutter these guys out, right? Back when I first started doing this stuff, I might have tried to use the QGIS plugin, waited 45 minutes, it would have crashed. You know what I mean? I would have bitched and moaned or whatever. But now, thanks to y'all, in my Jupyter notebook, I import GeoPandas, right? Have you guys heard, seen GeoPandas? It's like pandas with the geospatial stuff. So I'm able to take one shape file of all the parcels and another of the subdivisions, filter the subdivisions down, do a spatial join, get the subset of 136 or whatever parcels in Hollister Ranch. <sighs> Sorry. But then you may have noticed, if you look carefully at this file that, it, that was in the FTP, it had a suffix, underscore no owners. So I was able to find all the parcels in Hollister Ranch, but I didn't know who owned them. And if we're going to write the story, we got to know which one's James Cameron and which one's not, and da 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 So I emailed the guy. Names have been redacted to protect the innocent. Okay, so I emailed the guy at the county, and I said, dude, where are the owners? Can I have the owners? What's that? Oh, I got it. I should be using the clicker. Anyway, and so here's the email he sent me back. And you know, this stuff is public record, right? The data should be out there, but this is the kind of thing that happens in real life when you're like doing what we do. The guy says, well, actually, Ben, we cannot send you the ownership records and they cannot be published online because there's a state law that says that public officials' names and addresses cannot be published over the internet. Everybody else is in trouble. And our interpretation of that law administratively is that no addresses or owners can be published online at all, right? And this is the sort of thing that just like makes me, drives me crazy. And as we accumulate, as we try to ask for data like this from different government offices, what we often find is they often have different interpretations of these laws, and depending on who you're talking to, you're going to get different stuff. Their office is in Santa Barbara. I'm in El Segundo. Oh my God, they want me to drive up there, pay them 50 bucks to get a CDR and drive back down and do the merge, right? And so, unlike all you guys, I'm not very nice. So then I just start banging the table. And you can see I was like so angry writing this email, I accidentally put a question mark at the end of the first sentence which I didn't even mean to do, but, but after I sent it, I was like, yeah, I did mean that. You know what I mean? Even though it was totally accidental, there's like a typo, blah, blah, blah. And so then we begin a process where we're banging on the table. We begin calling all the politicians, hey, give us the owners. Ultimately, I did have to cut them a check, which I charged to our new billionaire owner, and they sent it to me via Dropbox file requests, which is an awesome feature, by the way. And then, now that I had all the owners, I had a complete data set of all the parcels in Hollister Ranch and who owns them. But I needed those value notices that were in that weird web page. They didn't have the database for that. So here comes my Jupyter notebook again, right? And some, like, uh, a scraper. Now, web scraping is like, if we had a conference like this for news nerds, like in my role, which we do, web scraping is like the number one most popular thing. Everybody loves this. This is a tool and feature in Python that is absolutely crucial to what we do because so much data 
is on the internet, but not in a format that we can like get at in how we want. And so tools like this, like requests and beautiful soup, which I love, and other things, are really important. And just to prove that, I put this up just to prove I'm not totally a bad guy, I did put a user agent letting them know who I was. And there's like a little time where it sleeps 10 seconds between requests, I'm not a bad guy, right? And so then we downloaded that, parsed the data out, merged it, and at the end of the day, ultimately the data analysis that we did is, is seen like in, in maybe 10 or, 10, 10 or 15 lines of Python. And it's, it's math that's so simple that I'm almost embarrassed to show it to this room, you know what I mean, because you guys are doing all this really sophisticated stuff. But at the end of the day, after we had been able to get all the parcels and all the value notices for the 130 whatever parcels, it really was just calculating the difference in the property tax break, right, for all those properties, summing it up, right, and then calculating basically the percentage, you know? And so then roughly speaking, the property tax of all these millionaires who live in these huge coastal elite mansions and deny you access to the beach is a 50% property tax break, which adds up to about $2 million last year and will continue to add up each year. And then that ultimately comes out as this. Because you know, you or I could maybe read this, but it lacks context. Uh, your mother probably doesn't read Python code. I know mine doesn't, but my mother definitely reads Steve Lopez. And so we then, took that data analysis and put it into a relatively traditional form, which was Steve's column, and he sort of unfurled the, the analysis and all the context, and this was in last Sunday's newspaper. And so that's a way, and this column is an example, of how all the open source tools that you guys work on and that we depend on in our business end up creating kind of a pretty traditional kind of like investigative story, right? And, uh, and but we do other things that aren't so traditional, that, are, that follow the same pattern. Um, oh. For this conference, actually, here's, I, I created a new repository, which we just open sourced over the weekend, which has all of the Jupyter Notebooks we've released for stories like this, including Hollister Ranch. If you go to datadesk slash notebooks on um, GitHub, you can find every single one of them, um, only some of them by me, a lot of them by my colleagues as well. Um, but a, an, another example from the past week of us taking data and turn it into news involved this guy, Pop Quiz, who is he? Okay, you can't win for that. <laughs> Too easy, even I, you know. All right, we'll have a better basketball one. And so Andy, Andy Roberson, who's on our team, she had been charged with creating for LATimes.com a Lakers roster to help our readers get to know all the different people on the Lakers and had little videos for each of them and their bios and stats and stuff about how tall they are and where their foot college they went to and all that stuff. And she made a really nice page, but we kind of felt like, oh, it could use like a little more data. It could use like a little more like oomph going on in the page. And so that's where Ryan Menezes came in, who's sitting right back over there. And, um, and he went and developed a data set that had, um, Ryan, just correct me where I get this wrong, basically the location on the court where all the players in the NBA shoot from and how well they shoot and how many shots they made from each of those positions. He then fed that into a different style of notebook, which is called an observable notebook. Who here has seen observable notebooks? You gotta check out this website, observablehqgut.com. It's by Mike Bostock, the creator of D3, and Jeremy Ashkenash, the creator of a lot of other cool programming stuff. And they're attempting to create a JavaScript notebook that's basically in the cloud, that is, is already a competitor to stuff like uh, Jupyter, and is an, inc an incredible product for um, for really rapidly creating interfaces and visualizations from data in like cutting edge JavaScript. I, I would really recommend checking it out. And Ryan was able to, with just a little bit of code in this notebook, take that data file we looked at before, wire it into a D3 hex bin system and create different shot charts for every player in the NBA showing where they shoot from and how they made it. We did a little bit of work to style it out in the Lakers colors. We export the X SVG from that. We move it into the website, and then here for each player, when you click on them, you get not just the bio and the video, you get also their shot chart, right? So there's Brendan Ingram. And so this is a case where we're using that data to help make something that's untraditional. It's not a newspaper article, right? It's like a web feature. It'll never appear in the print paper, and our team tries to really do both of those things. So here's LeBron James's shot chart, right? LeBron, he's good. All right, you may have heard. All right, next quiz. Whose shot chart is this? JaVale McGee, who said it? JaVale McGee. There he is, JaVale. JaVale looks pretty good so far this year. Yeah, he, <laughs> I've been impressed, especially defensively. Offensively, he's, he's got room to improve. <laughs> 
All right, so we don't just turn, um, turn data into news. We also often do the reverse. This is the second type of thing we do. And so I want to walk you through a couple examples of this. And that might sound glib, just flipping it around, but I'm serious. So here's an example. It's a serious example. So when I first started at the LA Times in 2007, uh, there was, um, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were going pretty hot and heavy. And the LA Times had already committed at that point to write an obituary of every Californian who died in either theater. And here's an example of one. And this, um, if, you start, if you put on what I call, when I talk to the, the normies, uh, your database glasses, which I'm sure is no trouble for you guys, and you look at uh, content like this from our website, um, you could begin to sort of guess kind of what database fields and columns are behind a system like this, right? Um, uh, a news story like this will have a headline, right? That'll be one column. There'll be like that little sub-headline, sometimes called the deck head in newspaper slang. There's the publication date. That'll be a column. That'll be date time format, right? And then what the journalists think is the most important column, the byline, right, with their name. And then in almost all news databases, after stuff like that, there's just another one that's just the big blob of text, right? Which is all the English that we put into it, just as one big crazy blob of text. And when I had arrived, the LA Times had already written um, hundreds um, of obituaries just like that of each person. And I was looking for a data project to, hook, to, to start off with, and I was looking for people to hook up with. And we decided, what if we were to build a database of these obituaries rather than just publish them as big blobs of text and forget about them. And if you keep those database glasses on and you, you begin to read a story like this, you can see the other columns that would be very easy to fill in for many of these. Like if we just look at the lead here, we can see we have the person's branch, their rank, their hometown, how they died, where they died, right? First, middle, last name, age, high school, right? Marital status, number of kids, da da da, gender, right? Go on and on. All those things can be classified. And so what we did is we pulled out all that, what would you guys call it in your slang? Labels or categories? I just call them columns or fields, right? Okay, good. I'm learning a lot of jargon here today. My favorite so far is fraudy, if something has like a high score in the fraud system. And so Malloy Moore on our team, who actually is a veteran herself and an educated librarian, um, did that basically. And we used another open source system that I don't hear as much about in this conference, but is essential to us, which is, would anyone know what this is? Django, it's the Django, I mean, you can't win twice. All right, so Django is a web framework that is kind of from the website of Python that was actually invented at the Lawrence Journal World newspaper and was used to launch websites ultimately like Instagram, Pinterest, and many others use it as like a framework for development on the back end. But one of the great features of it is it has an instant admin. So if you design a database table that has like the columns we were just talking about, it will create this generic admin with no code from you. It can just like infer it and do it. And for what we do, which is often assembling databases that don't exist before out of the news, right, a system like this to get a data entry platform like up and running is just huge, right? And so we put, this is it, we built the system and here's that same guy in the same story. First, middle, last name, gender, age, unique slug, uh, hometown, da 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 da. And when we had done that and assembled for all of them, we were able to do a lot more. We were able to build a website that had a page for every single person. And you could click the link of the hometown. And you could see everyone who's died from that hometown. And we could publish these pages before the obituaries were finished. Get the page out there on the web early. Um, get comments from people who knew them on the page. And, and turn, turn that data into a product that's not just a traditional story. But also, after you've accrued it, you're also to then able to mine that database you've, you've created for all sorts of enterprise stories. Once we're counting them, we know when the 500th person died. We can integrate population data and tell you what hometown has had the most deaths per capita. We can tell you what cemetery has the most guys buried at it, and then we can go write a Memorial Day story there. And we can take a more structured and you know, numerate approach to how we do a lot of traditional stuff, right? And that's because we took the news and we turned it into the database that didn't exist. Another example of that is the homicide report at homicide.latimes.com, which is a database um, that's kept by a few people on our team, mainly Nicole Santa Cruz, who's like the correspondent and writer who does a lot of it, and uh, Iris Lee, who does a lot of the kind of computer programming, web development stuff. And that also has a Django admin, where we're taking the source data, which is just the list of people who've been killed from the county coroner's office, and we're enriching that. You know, they only give us a couple data columns, really not a lot, 
we're, we're putting that in, and then we're adding more and more stuff from our reporting, and we're accruing over time this, this sort of unique original database about everyone who's been killed by another person. And in the same way, we can, we can use Django and a templated web framework to build a page for every, every person, including this guy who you probably don't know, this person who you probably don't know, but you should, um, and this person you definitely do know, right? And so um, the templating system and using even the sparse data we have to push it out through the system allows us to create a page for every single person who's died, which sadly in many cases is the only notice of the, the murder of many of these people. There's so little coverage. And then it becomes the kind of a baseline from which we can try to reach and do more elevated and insightful work. Um, a recent example would be this story Nicole did about all the people who die from street racing in LA County, which is actually a lot of people. Um, where we took our homicide report data, we connected it with some other data we did, and we were able to analyze what happens. And like one key finding here is that the majority of people who do this, who die in these cases, actually are uh, passengers. They're not the drivers, which is a, read the story, it's good. Um, and that also is a Jupyter notebook that you can get. Um, and besides stories, we also take the news and turn it into software, which then turns into more stories. So, um, like we were doing election results, you know, the live election results you see on election night and all the fancy maps and charts in every news organization. This was ours from the California primary. Um, and every single one of those pages on every single news site you look at, the data all comes from the same source, the Associated Press. So you don't have to worry about thinking one's faster than the other or better than the other. They're all the exact identical source that everybody pays in for. And that data service actually has some open source wrappers built around it. Here's one we built a few years ago, which was then succeeded by this. And this is a case of people in our news nerd world collaborating around the common problems we have, which are often gnarly data sets. You know what I mean? And gnarly data sets that need to be like refined and worked on and turned into data pipelines are like the number one need in our news nerd world for open source to help solve problems so that we can collaborate to get it done. Um, like, you know, and so here's LA County's crappy site. The AP doesn't have LA County results. LA County has this site, which you might think, oh, it could be worse, Ben. But then you crack open the data file, and here it is. It's not just a fixed width file. It's a fixed width file with different widths depending on what type of line that you're on. <laughs> And so Anthony Pesci and our team did the miserable work of like actually figuring out how to parse that file to do the whatever you would call a variable fixed width or whatever that is. And then we just yesterday uh, released that as an open source library so that hopefully nobody else has to do that like gnarly parse again. And when we have to do it again in two years, we'll remember because we like put it into a package, right? And um, if you're interested in our open source work, I made another repo, datadesk slash packages, which has the more than 30 open source repositories that our team has put out and maintains. Um, you, you'll notice that a really large majority of them have to do with dealing with gnarly data sets that we go to a lot. And then those, th those packages often then turn into stories. So like, um, anybody know what this site is? What's in it though? What's, on, what's in here? Uh, no? No, not this, this one, but this is called Cal Access. Anybody ever been here? This is my least favorite website. Campaign finance, so all the money that goes into the governor's race and all the propositions and all the state house races, as opposed to Congress and the federal stuff, all the state races, all that, all that money is reported into an awful database kept by the Secretary of State called Cal Access. And this is a really important database, but nobody does any analysis of it because it's a, it's a mess. It's, a, it's awful, right? And so that's where we created this group, the California Civic Data Coalition, to create a GitHub pipeline that would then take that data and, you know, um, and smooth it out and format it into something that's usable. And this is an ongoing project we have with more than 150 contributors around the world. And it's resulted in this still improving website where we create clean, documented CSVs that like a normal person can just pull down. The source data from the government is 88 tables, 35 million records, no documentation. Uh, about 40 of the tables are um, defunct, never been labeled. Uh, the joins are all screwed, it's such a mess. So we're trying to solve that, and because we've got that far, and we have these simplified versions, it's helping Ryan and Malloy, who you saw earlier, team with people like Seema Mehta, one of our political reporters, to do more stories about money and politics that are more ambitious analysis than would have been done. Because if you gotta spend six months doing the analysis, you're only gonna get that one story, and doing it again the next time, it's gonna take six months again. But we've reduced like the barrier to getting into that data, and we're trying to do more and more, which has allowed us to do stories like Gavin Newsom being the first guy to really uh, take money from pot, 
um, uh, do a dashboard of all the money coming into the state, um, state, state uh, the governor's race that updates really frequently. Then mining that for analysis, like being able to point out um, this, that the charter schools really put a lot of money into Villaraigosa in the primary. Um, being able to do historical analysis to show that that money from those outside groups was the most ever, you know, and giving that kind of context requires having all that data at hand. And then more recently, mining into every campaign donation Gavin Newsom, our likely next governor, has ever received to do kind of a story about his, his, uh, his, his, him coming in. And so California, or CaliforniaCivicData.org is where that's at, and this is kind of our biggest project right now of trying to bring people together to solve a common datum problem. I've got tons of problems and tickets and stuff in there. If anyone's interested in money and politics, this is a great place to get involved. There's other money and politics uh, things to get involved with too. If you're curious, just come talk to me. I'm running out of time. Our team does other stuff like bots and uh, tools and toys and other bullshit, but that's the end because I'm out of time. Um, you can follow us uh, at these links. And again, all the slides are at this URL. Uh, and that's, that's all I got. If you got questions, holler. So does anyone have any questions? Well, that's an interesting question. So the question is whether uh, the click rate uh, difference between interactive and static graphics, and this is a hot topic in the world of data visualization. You guys may remember like in the, the time of flash graphics, you know, and when data visualization really took off, everything had lots of hovers and boxes and things that jumped around and doodads, dancing bears is what Tom Turok at the New York Times used to call them. And um, recently, as the internet has moved more toward mobile phones, you may be noticing the graphics from uh, high-end viz people tend to be like just flat images, you know what I mean? Because they know you're on your phone and they think it's less likely you're going to interact. There's a little bit of a dispute about like the actual numbers behind that because I don't think there's been a serious study. But obviously the majority of people visiting LATimes.com and every news site are now doing it on a phone, right? And so whatever you make, it has to work on a phone and it has to be good on a phone. We can do things that are good on both, that are, that are simplified on the phone and are progressively enhanced on desktop, right? Which is what we try to do. But you can't overinvest in the desktop and in the desktop doodads. My feeling is, is that the interactivity is great and we don't want to lose it, but it's gotta be, it's gotta be awesome. You know what I mean? The, th the thing that it does, the thing that it, the dancing bear has to be a really good dancing bear for it to be worth the investment. <laughs> sure. Virtual reality? We've done a couple virtual reality experiments. I don't know if we've like invested a ton. Uh, maybe, maybe not. You know, I think there's some people who think VR is the future of storytelling, and there's some people who don't. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I think VR is really cool, you know what I mean? Um, we've done some things that I'm really proud of. One of my former colleagues, Armand Amandjame, did a VR tour of Mars, of the area where the Mars rover had like crawled around and you can like fly around. And it, it more than anything I've ever um, experienced, it really helped me understand the terrain of Mars, you know, so I thought it was an awesome, like, uh, experience, as we say in our business, sorry. Um, but whether it's going to be the future of news, as we also say in our business, I don't know. We'll find out. Well, you know, it's, the, a newsroom is just a collection of people, you know what I mean? And, and What's, what's that? Oh, his question was, are there some people in the newsroom who are less open to working with data, right? Is that your question? Oh, some sections? I don't think that, you know, I hate to generalize you know, as often as I do. <laughs> but um, um, no, I think, you know, it just kind of comes down to the person. You know, our kind of general philosophy is we want to work with people who want to work with us. And so we tend to seek out and partner people who like want to have that relationship. And we're lucky to be in a situation where our job is just to be like a catalyst, to just like make a cool story happen, make like a thing happen. And if we do that, we're good. So we don't have to like um, break down walls or deal with people who don't want to deal with us, which is a great thing about our setup, in my opinion. Hey. I got yeah. I got a question. Um, Please. So that uh, that story you uh, opened with, it's kind of it's easy to connect with, kind of at this populist level, like the fat cat 
getting the huge property discount because they're weird pets or whatever. But um, I'm wondering how often you guys um, run across stories that, I mean, at the end of the day, LA Times is still a business, and I'm wondering how often you guys run across a story that you feel like, this is interesting and it's worthwhile, but we got to kind of self-select out because it's not going to generate the clicks that we need to drive. Um, never consciously, you know what I mean? That's never like a thing where we know we can't do this story, no one will read it, that's never happened. You know, I'm sure there is in like the collection of humans and institutions some sort of subconscious or institutional bias around whatever. Like, why do we write more about the Lakers than the Clippers? You know what I mean? More people care about the Lakers. You know, there are definitely things like that. Um, no offense to Ryan, who's a Clippers fan. But, um, but no, I've never in my entire journalistic career had anyone say, we can't do a good story because people aren't interested in it. One cool thing about newsrooms is um, it's definitely full of people who are on the watch for stuff like that and are paranoid about it. And also, um, no one wants to get in the way of a good story. In a newsroom, if you got a good story, everyone will be supportive, which is one of the cool things about being in a newsroom. Hello. Uh, thanks for the talk. I wanted to hear about a time when you made a decision to... Uh, I'm back here. Uh, sensor data or like not share certain information that right. you found or how you think about it. yeah right so in this case I actually put the whole property tax roll with the names up there because I felt like it w it's it's standard practice in other counties and it's ridiculous that it's not public I can look it up online in most places in America and I just kind of wanted to make the point and so I did it even though no one will notice but there's definitely other cases where we don't because there's just no reason right if, um, and it could potentially backfire on the story if, if that becomes a distraction from what you're trying to tell. So for instance, one piece of public data that is public, that is rarely published online, is voter registration data. So how you vote is totally secret. Nobody knows how you vote, but if you're registered to vote, and in what party, and whether you vote yes or no, is a public record. And the political parties are using this data and getting it from the Secretary of State all the time, right? And we did a story about, um, a weird third party called the American Independent Party, which was formed by George Wallace to get on the ticket in the 60s here in California. And there's thousands and thousands of people, including the new owner of the LA Times, by the way, who accidentally registered in this party thinking it was being independent. But you're actually joining the American Independent Party. Oopsie, right? And so we did a story about that whole oopsie, and we made a lookup so you could check, am I in this like crazy party that I don't want to be in? And it would return like yes or no if you put your stuff in. But I didn't like uh, surface the whole database so that everybody could look up everybody else. I put a little birth date checker on there even though you wouldn't have to. Because I didn't want it to turn into a fishing exposition. I wanted to make it more of a service for readers. And I thought that could distract from the story. And so that's a case where we, it's an editorial judgment. You know, totally legally we could have published it. But it just didn't fit with what our goals were in publishing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so data science is really hot right now. Yeah. Uh, how are you? What is your like value add in the job market? Are you paying big salaries, or is it just like all the work is like really rewarding, or do you just like <laughs> Ryan? Hope that no could you one use notices? a raise? <laughs> Hell yes, we definitely could use a raise. You know what I mean? Uh, we're in a business that's collapsing. Let's be honest, right? And uh, and so there, there's there's a little bit of a premium for what we do but not so much that they're out there throwing a lot of money around, you know? Um, the reality is, is almost everyone I know who, who does what like we do are people who have, like, have, have some of these skills that you guys have or have an interest in them but aren't like super duper skilled, but we're passionate about journalism and we kind of like, you kind of see like, wow, if I learn these skills and I do this stuff, we can do these cool stories that we wouldn't otherwise do. We can make the news better. We can do better stuff, you know? And so for us, it, I think for most people, it kind of fits, the two things kind of go together. Your passion for news, and your interest or maybe passion for programming and stuff help you like push together. And there definitely are people who do what we do who now work, I, one of my, when I got hired in 2007, the guy who got hired the same day, he works at a hedge fund now, right? And I know people who work in mergers and acquisitions and da 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 da, and, uh, uh, but I, that's not for me. I wish it paid better, maybe one day. I'm trying to rewrite our job descriptions. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> I could use some tips on that, by the way. <laughs> if anyone's in a unionized newsroom or workplace. <laughs> yeah? So I have a question about yeah. the um, alternative facts news. The, the what? Or uh, f fake news. Fake news. Right. Um, well, it's sort of a two-part question. First uh -huh. of all, do you see the role of the press in uh, uh, trying to limit, identify, report on uh, 
or debunk fake news that are being spread around there through most commonly social media channels. And uh, do you guys work, uh, did you guys do any work in that, uh, in that area sure. specifically? Our team hasn't specifically worked on that, but I th in my opinion, there's been a lot of great uh, data journalism about fake news. Like I, the story I feel like really caught on that seemed to, as far as I know, was, was well done, was the BuzzFeed news story by Craig Silverman about how the most shared stories before the last election, uh, you know, the, were all fake. You know what I mean? Like the Pope endorsing Trump or whatever. And that was a case where he took his data journalism skills and he took it at this sort of inside the media topic and I thought it had an impact. And in my opinion, I think the media coverage about fake news, the real news about the fake news, right, has drawn a lot of attention to this problem which I think is good, you know, and I'm all for people doing that. Um, you know, I, I, I hear about, not being an expert, I hear about research that says when you debunk false claims, you just reinforce those claims in a lot of people's minds. There's like behavioral research on this. I'm not an expert. And it makes me worry that maybe we're not helping things, you know, but I don't, I don't have the solution. And as a journalist, you know, kind of my default assumption is always more sunlight is better, more coverage is better. And so I'm, I'm all for it. Um, and I, I think there's been a lot of great technology people who've helped news organizations uh, cover that story too. So, okay, last question. You can bug me afterwards too. Okay, um, my question is, oh, right. sorry. Yeah, uh, my question is, uh, can you talk a little bit about the data desk roles and how you go from collecting data, is that a specific role to somebody who's building the website and, and producing the visualizations? Uh, we don't really have like, uh, like firmly designed, uh, defined roles like, oh, you're the designer and you're the database administrator and you're the writer, you know what I mean? Maybe we should do that, but my feeling is on our team we're better off when everybody is kind of a generalist, when everybody is really comfortable I just say, people on our team, when we're looking for like young people to break in, I don't care if you can code, I care if you can like solve problems, you know what I mean? And if you're creative about solving problems with computers. And to me, that's like the essential skill of like what we're doing, is being a hard worker who's creative at like doing that. And the result is, is we have a team, it's kind of like a pretty oddball crew of people who have like different skills, like Ryan, who here, who's here, came through a statistics program. Malloy came through the army, right, and libraries. We have other people who came through traditional journalism schools and other routes, and we have some people who are better at HTML and CSS and JavaScript and other people who are better at Python, but they learn from each other, and it just kind of, we just kind of make, make stuff happen, you know, so we don't define it that much. Uh, we might need to if we want to get paid more, though, huh? Yeah. And, uh, um, but, no, we don't. Thank you. Yep. Oh, we can, you want to do more questions? Oh, more questions? I can, I can talk all night, guys. I, I have a question. <laughs> have you noticed? Okay. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, please. Oh, thanks. Um, I'm right here. OK. So last night, I saw The Soloist. Oh, uh, cool. Uh, and I would not have known who Steve Lopez is two days ago. Yeah. Uh, so that was cool that you mentioned him. Uh, that is a really wonderful movie, and it's all about this very kind of human story, this idiosyncratic yep. random meeting between two people, which leads to this That's know, right. big thing. Uh, I was curious, you know, you mentioned the future of journalism. You're talking about data journalism here. Do you see uh, the, the methods that you're talking about potentially growing in importance as they most certainly will, I think, but when they do, do you think that they could potentially wind up displacing or replacing the kind of human journalism stories that we well, so, that were mentioned uh, in, in that movie? I don't know. You know what I mean? I mean, you guys are the, uh, you know, uh, machine learning people. You can educate me about how far computers are going to get at writing stories. You know what I mean? Like the one bit of like automated news writing that our team has done is, um, is, uh, related to um, quakes, earthquakes. So there's like an automated, uh, there's data that gets sent out every time the government detects an earthquake. And one of my colleagues uh, wrote a bot that automatically writes a blog post about every earthquake that just has like the basic data and like a map. And then that gets sent to the copy desk every time the quake happens, we call it quake bot. And that's the sort of thing a lot of people look at and they say, gee, Ben, you're, you're killing, you're stealing our jobs. You know what I mean? But the reality is, in my opinion, is that the jobs are already gone. You know, the, the LA Times is one third of the size it was. If you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics numbers, the number of people who work in newspapers is 50% is what it was 10 or 15 years ago. Like, literally the industry is disappearing. And that's because of the change in the advertising model and the shift to the internet and the increased competition and all these other things that have, 
to be honest, nothing to do with the automation of content creation and everything to do with the automation of content delivery and distribution, right? And that's really what's changed our industry. And I feel like that's kind of boring and everybody loves the internet, you know what I mean? Because it's awesome. And so it's not as exciting to talk about as like the computer's gonna write the story instead. But those, those Quake posts that the bot is doing, nobody was doing them. You know what I mean? It's not replacing anybody. It's doing something we weren't doing. And it's relieving the people who work there from having to like scramble and write a little post every time their editor feels an earthquake, right? As opposed to doing an automated way. So I, I think that we are, the industry is in such a crisis and in such a deep thing of change. I, I don't see that as having a huge effect, you know? Um, maybe, you know, I think, sure, like the data cleaning, like I spend most of my time doing, as I tried to show in that. Maybe you guys can automate that work away from me. Please do. You know what I mean? I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so because the journalist in like, industry is so rough um, right now, I'm curious if you have any, like, if you've experienced any pushback on making things open source and just kind of sharing this with other journalists versus, you know, keeping some of these things private and in-house so that the LA Times has a monopoly on certain types of stories. Nah, nobody's really paying attention, I'll be honest with you. And, um, and, I, and if they, when they do, I'm kind of ready to make the case. You know, you look at something like that election stuff, I went over really, really fast. But that's a case where we would have spent weeks and weeks and weeks writing the same code that everybody else was writing, you know what I mean? And everybody's team is two or three or four or five people, and we just don't have the resources to, like, do all this stuff on our own. I don't think there's really a choice other than open source to solve a lot of the problems we have because we just don't have 100 engineers to throw at anything. You know, and so there's really only a couple places that can really have a competitive advantage at this, and they're the largest ones. And if you're in a smaller, mid-sized place, I think open source is your only only real opportunity. Now that said, there, you know, what, what's the old Linux thing? FUD, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. People raise about open source. That definitely happens. There was a long period of time where we had a lawyer who just like didn't like open source for some reason. So I just didn't put licenses on our repo because I just didn't want to have a conversation with a lawyer about a license. I just put it up. <laughs> and I get pull requests from the license nerds saying, you, you should add a license. And I was like, eh, I'm just not going to do that, you know. <laughs> because cause I don't want to have to defend that to the lawyer one day, you know what I mean? And then she, she left and now I put licenses on, so. <laughs> it's MIT, guys. I'm into MIT. I don't know about you. Hi, thank you so much for coming and speaking today. Thank you. Uh, in the back. Um, my question is, what is the current vision for the Times, and mm -hmm. how are you going to make the stories reach us um, and many other folks of our generation who have kind of split off? I, know that, I noticed that you guys have hired for podcasts, and that's one way, but what's the vision, and how are you reaching us? Well, that's above my pay grade and still being de developed. Uh, the LA Times has a new owner. His name is Dr. Patrick Soon Xiong. He is one of the richest people in Los Angeles and the richest doctor in the world. He made his money on pharmaceuticals a and other things, and now he's in his 60s and he's bought the LA Times as kind of a legacy project for himself, though he says he intends to run it fully as a business and not as a philanthropy. And so as of just a few months ago, we're in an entirely different ownership structure and fiscal situation than we were for the, the, the 20 years that preceded, right? And what that's gonna mean for us as an independent like thing owned by a, a, a single billionaire um, is still unclear. You know, and that strategy, we have a new editor, we're hiring for the first time in a long time, which is great. Um, I'm more optimistic about uh, some things than I have been in a while, which is good. Um, but what it's ultimately going to mean, I don't know. You know, I think if we follow the trends of the rest of the industry, it probably means moving toward, more towards a digital subscription model because digital advertising doesn't pay and it's failing for pretty much everyone. And so in order to finance the news organization, the readers have to pay more, right? And so that's why everyone's going to paywalls and that kind of thing. And that's been very successful for a few places. So I suspect we're going to invest more in that, but even that really hasn't been announced. I think it's still being determined in El Segundo as we speak. I'll be watching as closely as you, trust me. <laughs> All right, I think I have the, oh. the next question. This is the last one? Last one. OK, I get the last question twice in a row. OK. okay. Uh, uh, can I, um, so one of my biggest pet peeves is poor scientific journalism. I'm wondering if the data desk provides for the uh, LA Times uh, some statistical expertise for uh, pieces and, and kind of what you guys, what, what is your guys' role in that? We do when called upon, and we try to on the stories we work on directly, but it's not like um, there's um, 
a, a desk that every story comes by and we stamp it, yes, yes, the math is right. And I, like you, have picked up the paper someday and been like, I don't know about using percentage change right there. You know what I mean? Or, or whatever, right? Yeah. And, um, or is it billion or million? Are we sure? You know, like that kind of thing. And um, um, there isn't like a centralized process for that. We have editors and copy editors and people who go over everything really carefully, but there's not like a numbers editor who looks at every number in the paper. That's managed kind of on a story by story basis. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that we don't. Okay. It'd be exhausting if I did, I'll be honest. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, I have a few lotto tickets left. <laughs> that, yeah. Make it rain. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a fair way to give these out. What's that? Oh, okay. Yeah, we could use them, right? <laughs> Definitely true. Um, how about if you come up to me afterwards and tell, you, tell me about an L.A. Times story you read recently, proving you've read it. I'll give you a lotto ticket. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs>